In California in the late 1970s, rebellious teens, fueled by the conservative politics of the Reagan era and inspired by the faster-paced songs from older punk bands, created the hardcore punk rock genre. This hardcore movement revived punk rock music, furthered the frontier of the youth counterculture in America, spread anti-establishment ideals to a large audience, and led to the permanence of the alternative music scene. Hardcore was invented by two bands around the same time, the Black Flag and the Middle Class. The Black Flag was founded in 1976 by guitarist Greg Jinn and singer Keith Morris in Hermosa Beach, California. I'm about to have a nervous breakdown. My head really hurts. If I don't find a way out of here, I'm gonna go berserk. The Middle Class was established in 1977 by singer Jeff Ada in Orange County, California. It's not a coincidence that both of the bands hailed from Southern California. The politics, music scene, culture, and time all created the right conditions for the creation of hardcore punk. Meanwhile, older punk bands had gone belly up as punk's popularity declined. By 1979, the original punk scene had almost completely died out. The Sex Pistols broke up in early 1978, leaving the Ramones as the most popular punk band. However, they were a New York band, and a gap was left for punk to grow from the West Coast. Surf rock was already popular in California, and the area had the music venues and rock culture needed in order to spawn new bands, and the door flew open for younger suburban kids to create their own culture. As the West Coast punk movement expanded, a rift grew between the old and new punks. The new kids grew hostile towards older punks who left the culture and adopted a normal lifestyle while old punks tried to gatekeep suburban kids out of punk because the suburbs were considered uncool. These kids used punk to escape the norms of everyday suburban life, something that came to rise during the California conservative era. The Reagan dream was a content, complacent, and mellow suburban American class. Reagan shifted California right as he became governor there in 1967, replacing Democratic Governor Jerry Brown. Note the sudden conservative shift in the 1970s on this graph of Congress ideologies over time. This afternoon, Hardcore punk was created by suburban teens who felt trapped in the melancholy of American suburban life, full of fake smiles and cheerful ignorance of outward problems. Hardcore spearheaded the punk revival and was a fast-paced, aggressive, rough style of punk. I say the original spirit of rock and roll was just people, uh, it, it, was, it was meant as a form of attack, really. I don't think any art is legitimate unless it attacks people. The Black Flag were inspired by many bands that came before them. The Ramones, loud, fast riffs and songs, their progressive commentary, and the Grateful Dead's improvisational style. Just like the Ramones, Hardcore music combined cultural backwardness, an anti-mainstream attitude, and social critique. Although being one of the first to adopt hardcore punk, the middle class broke up in 1983 and never achieved critical acclaim or widespread success. Part of this was because touring was difficult. It was hard to sign contracts with local alternative venues while on the road, and alternative methods of transportation were not efficient or comfortable. Along with Black Flag, Hardcore bands continued to push the frontiers of hardcore, as their youth subculture grew larger and began to create political action. One of the most progressive and influential bands were the Dead Kennedys, formed in 1978 by Jello Biafra in San Francisco. Their music was full of satirical critiques of conservative politics in contemporary American life, most prominently in their 1987 album Give Me Convenience or Give Me Death. The album is a reaction to the Reagan era, and the conservative shift America was leaning into. I'd unplugged from popular culture in general consciously around eighth grade and never really paid that much attention to it anyway because my family didn't either. We had other things going on, including even when I was five and six years old watching the evening news when it was a lot less censored, bloody Vietnam War footage or uh, people marching across the bridge in Selma getting hoes and dogs and everything else. It was explained to the children instead of changing the channel. So I had very strong views, you now know well, from a very early age. Going back to the graph from earlier, you can see that Congress leaned right the most 
until 1987, right before the release of the album. Each song on the album tackles a separate theme of conservative politics. The song Holiday in Cambodia criticizes America's involvement in foreign affairs and its invasion of Cambodia and the pro-war messaging of the Reagan administration. Police Trump satirizes police brutality and violence, showing the similar attitudes between criminals and officers. I Fought the Law is a criticism of the corrupt U.S. justice system and capital hierarchy, and is told from the perspective of a rich corporate man who commits many crimes, like rape and murder, and gets away with it because he's powerful. Kinky Sex Makes the World Go Round is a mock skit, satirizing the greedy politicians who churn wars for profit, being secretly controlled by giant corporations. California Uber Alice creates a menacing dystopia where former California Governor Jerry Brown is a dictator president who suppresses his citizens with traditional culture like meditation in school, the monotony of daily life, and censorship masked with fake optimism akin to that of the Reagan era. It references George Orwell's 1984 and the Holocaust killings as a comparison for this dystopia. There's uh, plenty of people in the United States that would uh, probably, because they need a job or it's good for the economy, would probably work at a concentration camp. Core punk bands encourage their fans to create change in the world, creating a do-it-yourself attitude that apply to music and politics. If we get through to one person and crack their mind back open from all the school and church damage and uh, their parents' bogus attitudes, at least we're getting something done. I think what inspires us the most isn't people who come up, oh, Dead Kennedy's your god, oh, Jello, you're my idol. That's kind of makes me feel like a zoo animal in a way. It's real humiliating and embarrassing. But um, the people who come up and say, well, yeah, we like your stuff, and uh, so now we've made this record, we've made, we've written this, or we've uh, made this magazine or film or painting or whatever. People who go out and do something on their own. They saw young teens as being a vehicle for change and creative thought and created unique meeting places for like-minded youth. Public schools wouldn't let counterculture discourse happen on their grounds, so concerts, venues, and music groups became places for youth to meet together and create a connected movement. All ages policies were adopted at hardcore punk concerts so all youth could participate. In the case of Hazelwood School District v. Kohlmeyer in 1988, the Supreme Court ruled that high school administrators could make final edits on all school newspapers, limiting student expression. Writing for the court, Justice Brian R. White noted that First Amendment rights of students in the public schools are not automatically coextensive with the rights of adults in other settings. Those rights, he argued, must be applied in light of the special characteristics of the school environment, and schools do not need to tolerate student speech that is inconsistent with their basic educational mission. As an alternative to school newspapers, handmade fanzines, normally used to spread news about hardcore punk music, were used to spread political messages in cartoons and planned protest dates. Fanzines published the 1-800 numbers of right-wing organizations, encouraging readers to call and waste time, cleverly turning the organization's public outreach programs against them. They published lists of corporations with bad track records so viewers could avoid them. Some fanzines preached vegetarianism and argued against meat consumption in their ads. Fanzines could also be used to distribute cassette tapes of albums and homemade mixtapes that became easier to access and create. Some musicians didn't have enough capital to open record stores or distribute to stores across the nation, so instead opted for a mail-in distribution system. The do-it-yourself attitude was extended to protests, which tried to directly engage in political expression similar to radical protests from the 1960s. There were protests such as the war chest tours, where protesters mocked dying and threw fake fallouts at different war corporations' buildings' entrances. At the July 1984 Democratic National Convention, over 1,500 protesters held a Rock Against Reagan concert as part of this tour. In the Shadow Project, protesters painted shadows on walls and sidewalks to symbolize what will remain after a nuclear war. Punk percussion protests were held in front of the South African Embassy. Punk percussion protests were held in front of the South African Embassy 
against the inequality of South African apartheid. Eventually, organizers tried to tie protests together into one day of mass action. On No Business as Usual Day, on April 29, 1985, protests were held against the escalation of the arms race and the possibility of a World War III. The do-it-yourself attitude was present within every aspect of hardcore punk, even in music labels. Independent labels were created to resist corporate monopoly over the music industry and to make alternative music profitable. Alternative bands had to put out their own records, and SST Records started that. They put out Black Flag and their friends' bands, like a Miniman and Husker Du and the Meat Puppets. Independent labels were pro-consumer and discouraged reselling by putting Pay No More Than stickers on products. Independent labels were created to fight the mainstream. SST Records' slogan was, Friends Don't Let Friends Buy Corporate Rock. Although the hardcore punk culture culture was passionate and unified through their music taste, the downfall of the movement came from its own growth and the expanding mix of philosophies it contained. The counterculture didn't have any concrete platform and was reactionary and began to fragment into separate countercultures. By 1987, hardcore punk was on the decline and bands were forced to go broke or go big, to fail or to water down their rock sound and enter the mainstream scene. Punk bands that broke big became headliners at large venues and were no longer underground. Warner nabbed their Ramones, Virgin picked up the Sex Pistols, and CBS had the clash. Punk infiltrated the system and planted its flag in pop culture. The hardcore style of punk rock was watered down to aggressive rock with no meaning or substance and became marketed to a wide audience with new big bands. Most of the independent labels went broke, but some remained and became the foundation of alternative music. So, what, what do you think of the people that have, have said and accused you of selling out? Well, we've had a lot of chances with the same people in the same machinery to be uh, vaulted off into X and Go-Go's land. The same people who did R.E.M. and Wall of Voodoo and Go-Go's and whatnot offered that machinery to us and even made efforts to nudge us there a little bit, and we didn't want to do that. These indie hardcore labels still exist today. SST Records, Fearless Records, Discord Records, and many others that were inspired by them. Famous bands were founded right after hardcore punk, such as Nirvana in 1986 and Green Day in 1987. As Greg Jinn of The Black Flag puts it, there are a lot more rock bands in 2012 than in the 50s and 60s, and a lot more variety because making music became a lot more accessible due to hardcore punk. Hardcore punk was one of the first movements to recognize the bridge between politics and culture and respond to it, but still failed to stop their culture from being swallowed into consumerism. The punk rock subculture was dead, consumed by the mainstream music scene. In its wake remained the hope that through the creation of independent culture and opposition, America could change for the better and embrace diversity of thought. What we consider successful is uh, if somebody walks into our gig with a closed mind and walks out with it somewhat open.